Hi, everybody. This is Todd Krieger. And today I'm talking to you about rediscovering passion, reigniting the spark in long term relationships. Uh, in this uh, talk I'm giving right here to you, uh, I'll be talking about a few things. I'll take a few notes here. Um, I'm going to be talking to you about how we weren't trained to have a long, hot marriage. And yet it's totally possible. We're going to talk about the importance of devoting time and attention to this process of reigniting passion. We're, we're going to talk about uh, how it happens, how oftentimes actions precede feelings. We're going to talk about how we have differences, different sexual accelerators and breaks. And uh, we're going to talk about being playful. And we're talking about taking chances. That's kind of what I'm going to be talking about in a nutshell. So let me get into it. Uh, I wrote a book, came out in 2008, called The Long Hot Marriage. And that, that little book is, is uh, still selling. And I, I think it's as relevant today as it was 15 years ago. And, you know, one of the things that I talk about in that book is how um, we, we haven't been trained to have long, hot marriages. I mean, most of us don't have ancestors, parents, grandparents that really had long, hot marriages. Now, what do I mean by hot? I mean alive. I do mean passionate. I mean sexual, but not just sexual. Uh, there's an energy. There's, um, there's a kind of thing where your eyes light up when you see each other. That doesn't mean that couples that fit this category of passionate, that they don't have problems or conflicts or challenges, or they don't have good, bad days as well as good days, but that there's a certain quality to them. They're alive together. So we weren't trained because our parents, it was really, they were in reactivity. They were in survival mode a lot. Um, they didn't know any better. They didn't know how to connect in pain, which I'm not going to get into all that, but honestly, we we do need to become, you know what, I, I will get into it right now. I changed my mind. We it, you know, One of the qualities of having a long, hot marriage or a passionate, alive marriage or one that has a spark or committed relationship doesn't have to be marriage, is when you could be tuned into each other, you have the emotional muscles to stay present with each other, with each other through pain and that in and of itself, since it's such an important thing that I left out in my original notes, uh, our parents and grandparents didn't do that. If they were angry, they fight, they would fight or flight. And that's what we do. That has to be worked on so that we could have a passionate relationship. We, need, we all have pain, conflict, frustration. If we don't have a way to stay tuned in and tuned and present to the other person when, when they're in pain, we don't get to that heavenly place when we're not, we can't be partners in our hell. We can't talk to be partners in our heaven. So that is an important thing that we haven't learned. Among other things that we didn't learn from our parents, like they didn't, uh, when it came to interpersonal relationships, people were comfortable. They did what was comfortable for them. Well, that doesn't work. So we, we, we need to get out of our comfort zones. Not always, but pretty consistently to have a, a relationship that has passion. So anyway, don't be hard on yourselves if you're not doing that. It just means that we didn't have training. As I've said in my book many years ago and all, since then, is that if I want to be a doctor, I go to med school. If I want to do what I'm doing here, I, I've been to grad school and go to workshops, conferences. I've, been, I've, been, I've taught others. That's how they learn. Uh, I'm also a learner. Uh, I, I'm, I'm learning golf. I'm, I have a lesson on Thursday because I need the help. Well, who trains us to be a passionate, alive partner in a relationship with another passionate, alive partner? Our parents were in trouble. So we need to appreciate that and, and be willing to learn. The other thing about is the importance of uh, devoting some time and attention to this process. You know, anything that we want to flourish, we need to give attention. Even if we get a plant, we gotta nurture it, we gotta give them water and sunlight. 
got to understand what its needs are. And so it's the same in our relationship. We do need to devote time. And the good news, it doesn't take lots of time. It doesn't take like hours and hours and hours, you know, to a day to have a passionate relationship. It could take minutes. Sometimes you could do hours, of course, but it could take minutes. And so it is important to, to, um, to, to have time, to set aside time and attention to our connection. The other thing I want to mention is that, you know, when we first get together, we're motivated by our feelings and by our neurochemistry. We are, um, it's almost like we don't have a choice in the matter. When we find somebody that we're really attracted to, we just want to spend time. We could talk for hours. We set up dates. We give attention. And it is totally motivated by feelings. When we get committed. Some of us have children and we get pretty busy. And then we have maybe some frustrations with each other. So what oftentimes happens is uh, for many of us, we're, we're oftentimes not automatically in the mood to connect, to touch, to be romantic, to be playful. We're not in the mood because oftentimes we're stressed or we're weighed down or we've gotten out of the habit of doing this with our partner. And so if we wait to feel like it, if we wait to be in the mood, like a man that I listened to speak once said, if you wait to be, if I, if my wife waited to be in the mood to have sex with me, we'd have sex every February 29th. So that was a funny line. But it's, not only, it's not only about sex, it's about many things. We can't wait to be in the mood. We have to set an intention. We're going to connect. We're going to get out of our task oriented ways. I work with a lot of couples that oftentimes have young children, but even those that have older children, it doesn't matter. And, and some that don't have any children, they're just bogged down by work and other things, and they have lost their way as, a, as an intimate, passionate couple. And we, we just can't wait to be in the mood. We need to have that intention. Let's just do this, whether we feel like it or not. Let's spend some time together. I worked with a man yesterday. He says, oh, I'm just not touchy-feely, and my wife would love for me to be more touchy-feely. I gave him the exercise of doing what's called a sensate focus exercise, where he gets to touch his wife for five minutes with a caress, not a massage, not a clinical thing, but five minutes, and to notice as he's doing that five minutes of touching, using his hands, he uses his lips, his lip, his tongue, but mainly his hands probably, and as he does that he, he needs to focus on what it feels like to touch his wife's skin in these different areas and i'm not even having him do the genital areas for this first week just to get the habit of touching which they've lost you know, as a couple they've lost their way and she is supposed to totally tune in to how it feels to be touched in that way and then after five minutes they switch she becomes the toucher he becomes a touchy and both of them at all times are paying attention to how it feels, whether they're the toucher or the touchy. So then what happens, and I see this all the time, is as people start to do the behaviors as if they wanted to, things get aroused, feelings happen. The dopamine neurotransmitter gets triggered. It starts to feel good. It's the beginning of a new habit. You can't wait to be in the mood. Feelings often follow actions, and it's not the other way around. And sometimes it is. That's great. But don't depend on that. Don't depend on that. And don't judge you if you go, oh, I just, like I've had people say, I love my partner, but I've fallen out of love. I'm not in love. And I go, big deal. You've been practicing acting like roommates for a long time. Let's practice something else and then see what happens. I'm not saying that. It will come back, but it oftentimes does. Oftentimes does. The other thing I want to talk about is that we are different, and we have different, um, uh, as Emily uh, uh, Nagoski talks about in her book, uh, 
come as you are excellent book on how to reclaim sexuality it's, it's focused for the women but i recommend it for men and women and um and everybody for that matter of any gender and she's very very um, embraces diversity uh, and she talks about ex- sexual accelerators and sexual breaks those things that get us going sexually those things that make us stop and we have different accelerators and different breaks some people have high sexual acceler- uh, accelerators and low sexual breaks these people got to reel it in they, they might be the ones that could um use sex as a way of regulating uh, like in an addiction kind of thing um there are those that have high sexual breaks and low sexual accelerators we've got to find out what those breaks are so that we can work around those things and there's those that have high low low high that we're all different then we want to learn we want to learn about each other and ourselves what turns me on what turns me uh, what gets me shut down um, so no matter how long you've been together i work with people that are together for decades that oftentimes they there's things they know about each other but there's lots of things they don't especially in the area of intimacy and rekindling passion and what it takes what's the right key to unlock your lock what's the where's the portal your sexual portal or your aliveness portal again i don't want to just say sex because it's more about also the energy which i'll get to in a minute so like again viva la difference we're different celebrate the differences and be interested in each other don't think that your partner should be like you of course i talk a lot when i work with uh, heterosexual couples where Oftentimes men are more visually stimulated and they don't understand that women need to be kinesthetically stimulated. They need to feel close to us. That's their sexual accelerator. So women need to understand what accelerates the men in these cases, the men, the women, it's not always that way. It's not, but oftentimes there is a propensity for men to be accelerated, to have arousal just by visual cues and for women that's not enough and that's just fine that's just what we have to understand what's the truth let's discover it like i said viva la difference okay the next thing i want to mention is playfulness a lot of couples have stopped being playful maybe they weren't playful when they were younger i have a couple i saw yesterday where uh, she never was allowed to be playful so i um we're talking about being playful with our partner and using the relationship as an opportunity to be, to be more playful. And sometimes for some people, playfulness isn't easy. It's not comfortable. They say, it's not my nature. I'm quoting her. And I go, I don't care. And the truth of the matter, it is your nature. You just forgot. Think you weren't playful when you were one, two, three years old? We're all naturally playful until you know it might be squashed out of us or you might be playful and you get into a relationship and you're playful as a as a couple but then you you know because of situations at home and work that you stop being playful you become very centered on getting things done you're in survival mode we got to devote some time and attention to getting out of survival mode and being playful and some of the things we talked about is asking your partner to dance uh, skipping down the street that might feel weird good like I said earlier sometimes you got to do the action the feelings will follow you want to you want to experience your playfulness act playful before you're in the mood because you might have lost the habit of being in the mood sometimes for years sometimes for decades doesn't matter it just doesn't matter you practice being playful your, your playful nature will will resurrect itself. That is part of your nature, whether you you remember that or not. And the last thing I want to talk about is taking chances, taking risks, being open. We need to try new things in the bedroom and out of the bedroom. Go to new places. Go to a different restaurant. Hike a different trail. Try a new sexual position share something that turns you on that you never shared before 
with your partner of 10, 20, 30, or 40 years. Ask yourself some questions. What is it that I don't pay attention to that I want, that maybe I've wanted but didn't give it enough attention? What might that be? Be open to newness in yourself. And of course, be open to the newness in your partner and then do things new as a couple. There's nothing in life that we're successful at without taking some chances. I'm learning golf. Every time I get out on the golf course, I'm taking a chance. I don't know how I'm going to hit the ball. Well, not so well. Oftentimes it is not so well. I learn from it, try something, you know, and I try new, something new. Try something new. And then that's when it works. And um, careers, successful careers, we have to take risks. We got to sometimes stand out. We got to be willing to fail to succeed. We got to be willing to expose ourselves with our partner. We're not you know, be, without being sure what our partner's reaction will be, but we take a chance. So if you do all these things, and this might be a talk you listen to more than once, you start to give yourself permission to do the things and say the things and eventually feel the things that make you feel like, wow, we do have a spark. There is an aliveness. There's an energy with us, between us. All those things matter that I just talked about. So I wish you the best in having that long, hot marriage to have to, to, to discover or rediscover that spark. And uh, I wish you the best. Thanks for listening. This is Todd Krieger, making the world safe for love.